One of the fundamental aspects of GIS data and the way it's organized is a relationship between the spatial or geospatial data, the graphical stuff that you see in the map, and the attribute or non-spatial data. And we can see that in a variety of ways. Um, the easy way to see that is probably by identifying the information about individual features. So in ArcGIS we have this button right here called Identify. And if I click on that and then choose any feature uh, that I like, either a city or a river or a state, and click on it, a table pops up with information about that individual feature. Okay, So the question is, or the question I'm asking right here is, where is this information coming from? Well, this information is coming from an attribute table that's connected to the GIS layers. So for the moment, I'm going to focus on the rivers layer to kind of highlight that point. So I'm going to turn off the other two layers for a second. So we're just looking at the rivers layer. So just like with the cities, if I click on an individual river, I get this table that pops up, right? And it contains a name, the system, length. If I, however, want to look at the full attribute table that's associated with this layer, I right click on the rivers layer and the context menu pops up and I'll choose open attribute table. And the attribute table that comes up is the attribute table, the non-spatial data that's connected to the rivers layer. Okay. The way that this is organized, all right, this table, each of these rows is called a record, right? And each record is connected to one of these line segments, one of these features. Each of these columns, it's named, is called a field. And the field contains an attribute of some sort, a descriptive piece of information, either a name or a mileage or whatever kind of information you want. Now, because it's a table, it's not a spreadsheet. This is an important kind of distinction. The table is organized so that the records maintain their integrity and they can't be moved around and you have to put certain kinds of information in certain fields. This is very different from an Excel spreadsheet, for example, where you can put data anywhere you want in any cell and in fact you can sort one column and not sort the others. Uh, in this uh, database, in fact, if I were to sort any particular column or field, I'll sort names, for example, I'll right click on it and choose sort descending which will change the alphabetical order of the sorting, all of the records will move accordingly. Again, and that's in order for every line, every row, every record to stay intact, right? And so that's kind of a fundamental aspect of databases in general, but definitely the case for attribute tables, which are the non-spatial data databases for, for a GIS. So let me sort that back to where it was a sort of sending. Okay, so early when I clicked on one of the records, brought up that bit of information that corresponded to that one feature. In fact, if I click on, or select rather, uh, one of these uh, records in the attribute table, right, what you should see is that the corresponding line segment in the graphic also lights up. Right? And this is how they're related. This one record is related to this one feature, and this there is a one-to-one -one correspondence for all these elements. And in fact, all the vector data is organized that way. Every single feature is connected to one record in the attribute table. And I can do the reverse too. If I choose this select features button, which looks like a white arrow on a blue and white background, I can click on another river, for example. It'll highlight that segment, and then what we'll see is the corresponding uh, record in the table is highlighted as well. Okay, let's say that I want to look a little more closely at how I can use the attributes of the data here. So I'm going to clear the selection by hitting the clear selection button here on the table so it unhighlights it and I'm going to um, well let's clean up the map a little bit I want to see the states and rivers so I can get a little context so I'll turn that back on and I want the rivers to look more like rivers so I'm gonna make them blue which seems pretty obvious so I'm gonna click on the lines beneath the rivers uh, name right here and luckily uh, there's already a symbol style called river but if I wanted to and I'll click on that if I wanted to, I could change the color to anything I wanted, any width, um, and I could make all kinds of alterations. But again, this is the simplest option there. So I'll hit OK. The rivers turn blue. Uh, the states at the moment are purple. Um, whenever you add data to ARC, vector data in particular, it, it randomly assigns a color. You can always change it or set it ahead of time in a different way, but we'll go over that later. Uh, for the moment, I'm going to turn the states to a more uh, uh, a color that will contrast a little better with the with the rivers. So I'm going to click on the box right underneath states, 
and that'll bring up the symbol selector again. And I think I'll make the states beige. And I'll change the outline color to a nice middle gray so it's not so prominent. And I'll OK. And there we go. So the rivers stand out a little better now so I can see them a little bit more. In fact, you know what? I think the rivers could be a little thicker. So I'm going to make, I'm going to click on the line for rivers again, bring up the symbol selector. I'm going to increase the width to 2. Oh, there we go. Now they really stick out. This is probably a little ugly for a map, but for the moment it'll work for us. Okay, so again, we're playing with the graphics here. Let's go back to the attributes, attributes for a second. What can we do with the attributes? Well, let me open the attribute table again. Um, you see in the attribute table that there's a bit of information around each of these. And one in particular is names, right? So the name data, that's useful. I can click on it and bring that up, but what about labeling? Well, if I right click on rivers, I bring up the context menu again, and I can choose label features, and what it'll do is it adds the river names to the line segments, right? And that information is coming from the attribute table. Okay, what else can I do with this? Well, with the attribute table again, you notice also that you have uh, mileage over here. You have the lengths of the rivers. So let's say if I was looking for longer rivers, right? And I already have a suspicion. I think I know my geography fairly well. So I'm, I'm guessing that if I was looking for the longest rivers within the U.S., it's probably going to be uh, Mississippi might be one of them. So if I right-click on the miles column or field and I sort it descending, right, going from the larger to smaller, I'll see the longest rivers. Okay, and I can see the list right here. And I see that the St. Clair, part of the St. Lawrence system, is the longest river, but that's really mostly in Canada. That's not in the U.S., so that's not quite what we want. So it looks like the two long rivers, the Missouri, which is part of the Mississippi system, and the Mississippi. So Mississippi actually appears to be the second longest river within the U.S. So, But I know the Mississippi more closely, so let's look at that one. So I click on that one, and of course it lights up here on the map, all right? And so I can see that. Um, I'm also interested in this case in the Ohio River and I'm particularly interested in knowing how long the Mississippi and the Ohio are in total. What would be the total length of these two rivers? Well this is something I can also figure out from the attribute information. But in order to do that I need to select both of them simultaneously. So to do that I'm going to have to uh, highlight the Ohio River as well. So to make this easier, I'm going to turn off the states for a second so we just see the rivers. And then I'm going to hold down the shift key on my computer and click on the Ohio River. And what that's going to do is now I have both the Mississippi River highlighted and the Ohio River. And you can see them also highlighted right here in the attribute table. But let's say that they were spread apart and they weren't near each other and I was trying to look for them. Well, a quick way to find them would be to click on the Show Selected Records button right down here at the bottom of the attribute table. If I click on that, it only shows me the records that have been highlighted. Right? Now what I can do is I can go to the Miles field, right click on that, and I can choose Statistics. And Statistics will give me, well, statistics about those two records, right? And specifically the two entries in that field. And so what I have now is right over here I've got the count. There were two records selected, obviously. The minimum is the lower of the two uh, lengths. The maximum is the highest of the two. And the sum is the number that I'm looking for right here, right? So the cumulative or the sum total length of the two rivers combined is a little over 3,500 miles. And I, also get, and I also get a statistic for the mean or the average. Okay, um, this statistic is really powerful. It gives you a quick way of looking at any kind of numeric information uh, that's in, in one of the fields, or specifically um, ratio or interval data. You wouldn't want to get statistics on nominal uh, numeric data. That wouldn't make much sense. So uh, what's important to keep in mind though is it will pull up statistics about whatever's selected. So uh, going back to showing all records, if I was interested in finding out the statistics for all the rivers in this attribute table, I need to make sure that I don't have anything selected. I'd need to click on the Clear Selected Features button so that nothing is currently selected. right? And now when I right click on the miles field and choose statistics, I'll get statistics for all of the rivers that are shown in that attribute table. And now I can get um, 
the sum total of all the rivers in the in this layer, right? Some of these extend outside the US as well as the average and other information that I might need. So there you go. There's a quick introduction to using ArcGIS and moving around in it. And if you have any questions, I hope to see those on the discussion forum.